I'm going to tell you a dirty secret about fantasy sports. The smaller the contest you play, the better chance you'll have to win. That's obvious, right? I mean, it is very fun to chase $200,000 top prizes for just a $10 entry in the big board contest. I've been doing it myself. But the truth is that winning players can realize their edge more reliably and more consistently in smaller tournaments. Fortunately for us, Underdog has provided us with an additional option for drafting this offseason, where sharp drafters will have a real chance to take down a $20,000 top prize against less than a couple thousand opponents. In this video, I'm going to walk you through my pick-by-pick -pick strategy of a recent 20-round draft I completed in a new $100 buy-in contest on Underdog Fantasy called The Biggest Board. Let's do it. Here are the settings for the biggest board, which do differ from the big board. It's a $100 three max contest. And for reference in the big board, users can put in up to 150 entries. The biggest board has only 1,632 entries. It also has a 34 person final as opposed to 558 in the big board. There's $20,000 up top to first in a super smooth payout structure where 10th place gets $2,000. And the biggest and best wrinkle is the advancement structure. So instead of in the big board structure where you need to finish three out of 12 in your regular season group, you then need to finish one out of 10 in a week 15 pod, and then one out of 10 in a week 16 pod. The biggest board though, only requires you to finish four out of 12 in the regular season, top two out of eight in week 15, and top two out of eight again in week 16. That difference from needing to finish in the top 10% in back-to-back -back weeks to only needing to finish in the top 25% is massive as far as increasing your likelihood of advancing to the final. As I walk through my picks for this draft, I'll explain how I deviated my strategy slightly from a regular big board draft to account for the differences in a smaller contest. All right, let's dig in. Round one, pick seven, Justin Jefferson. I happily scooped up Justin Jefferson here, and I can't understand why he's dropping. Kirk Cousins is gone. There's QB uncertainty. There's sexier clicks like B. John Robinson. But I don't want to be in the business of overthinking the best wide receiver in football after six picks are gone. Jefferson put up 30 receptions, 475 yards, and two TDs in four games last year with, yes, Nick Mullins. That was after missing two months with a hamstring injury, by the way. He also wildly finished with a higher yards per route run with non-Kirk quarterbacks last year than he did with Kirk. You know, I think back to last year where people felt silly overthinking CMC at 101. He was regularly slipping to two and three and four in drafts. And I have a feeling that we're all going to look back and wonder why we were letting Jefferson fall this year. Round two, pick 18, Marvin Harrison Jr., Round three, pick 31, Malik Neighbors. There is a lot of debate right now about who is actually his top rookie in the 2024 class, but I decided to just become the why not both dot gif here. After Garrett Wilson and Nico Collins come off the board, there's a very long tier of wide receivers that stretch until the late third round. I think you could basically shuffle them up and order them however you want, and I wouldn't think you were crazy. I did think I could have gone Drake London here at 18. He definitely feels a bit safer than Harrison, but it's really just a preference thing. Harrison and Neighbors are both insane prospects. Dwayne McFarland just updated his rookie wide receiver model to include the 2024 prospects, and Harrison and Neighbors represent two of the top three prospects spanning all the way back to 2018. Only Jamar Chase joins them on the podium as far as the best wide receiver prospects over the past seven years. The talent, the draft capital, and shockingly even good quarterback play if they do go to the Cardinals or the Chargers like we dreamed up in our perfect video last week, could be there for both of these guys. And both are fully capable of paying off these ADPs, even with the rookie sticker shock being undeniable. Round four, pick 42, Lamar Jackson. Round five, pick 55, Mark Andrews. Both of these picks were such easy clicks for me. The stacking element of this is obvious and getting an elite QB and his elite tight end at these prices feels very comfy. The three round discount on Andrews compared to where he went last year is a total gift. 
In our big board tips video, Jacob outlined this exact strategy for zero RB, which is basically because there's so much value laid at wide receiver in these early drafts, you can afford to take detours away from the wide receiver position in the early rounds. In doing so, you can not only get an elite QB and an elite tight end like I did here, but also save two to three roster spots for wide receivers late. I also think because the Ravens defense was so good last year and because Andrews missed a lot of time, the ceiling of this stack and just this passing offense in general is being underrated right now. Round six, pick 66, DeAndre Hopkins. Zero RB has been a major focus for me in these early drafts, which Davis Maddock highlighted as well in our tips video. I was hoping Jordan Addison would fall to me here so I could build out more Vikings team correlation with Jefferson, but I was fine settling for DeAndre Hopkins in this spot. I think if I'm being honest, I'm mostly neutral on Hopkins. I think he's a solid, not bad, not great pick, but it's more about what happens to wide receivers in these drafts after Newt comes off the board. For me, he represents the last of a tier in the running back values in round seven and eight are just much, much stronger than the wide receiver picks. I'm sorry, I'm not taking Deontay Johnson at pick 74. I absolutely can't. And also another bonus for selecting Hopkins is that he opens up one of my favorite stacks late with the uber cheap Will Levis. Spoiler alert. Round eight, pick 79, Ramondre Stevenson. Round nine, pick 90, Tony Pollard. Round 10, pick 103, Trey Benson. Round 11, pick 114, Jonathan Brooks. Yes, we've entered the Goldilocks zone for zero RB picks. And after going six straight rounds without a running back, it was finally time to start taking some stabs. With Stevenson and Pollard, I'm getting to buy the dip on talents who are going in the second and third round last year. Stevenson will likely be getting a big upgrade at quarterback. And with a new coaching staff, I like making a bet on his talent, even with Antonio Gibson in the fold, who let's be honest, has never been able to command a lot of touches. I also love this price on Pollard. I thought he was gonna shoot up after signing with the Titans, but he dropped in this one going 10 picks after ADP. He's a near lock to lead the Titans in touches, and he also correlates with my Hopkins pick. Building out these big team level bets was sacrilegious his pro tip from our previous video. And if the Titans do take a leap with all of their new talent, Pollard will have a path to a bunch of TDs and pay off this price. After this, we double tapped a couple of rookie running backs, Trey Benson and Jonathan Brooks are projected to be the first and second running backs off the board in this 2024 draft. And there are a couple of extremely juicy landing spots for rookie running backs. The Cowboys have 70% of last year's carries up for grabs and the Chargers have a massive 87% of theirs up for the taking. If Brooks and Benson were to land in one of these spots, they'd immediately vault into the sixth and seventh round of drafts, which gives me a chance at some big closing line value with these picks in the triple digits. And please, whatever you do, don't forget about Brooks's connection with Dallas. You're literally looking at a Zeke Elliott Rico Dowdle backfield for potentially the start of the season in that scenario where they sign Zeke. And people do forget. This is this is the biggest people do forget right now. People do forget that the doctor who performed the procedure on Brooks's knee is the Cowboys head physician. This, if you guys want to just woo people at a dinner party at the bar. You tell people that the doctor <laughs> who repaired and did the procedure on Brooks's knee is also the Cowboys head physician. That's how you win hearts and minds. That's how you flex that you're the ultimate ball knower. You let people know because people do forget. For more insights like this, tune into Best Ball Breakfast on the Pete Overs at Livestream channel every Monday at 10 a.m. Round 11, pick 127, Dontavian Wicks. All right, this draft was pretty smooth sailing through 10 rounds, one elite QB, one elite tight end, four wide receivers, including the top two wide receiver rookie prospects, and four zero RB selections that also include the top two rookie prospects. It was time to get back on track with the wide receivers, and I had a tough choice. I could grab a rookie like Keon Coleman, who might sneak into the first round of the draft, but I had a hard time passing on Wicks here. Wicks checks a ton of boxes for a double digit wide receiver selection. He's young, he's a 22 year old second year breakout candidate, and he's on an ascending offense with a good QB. And not to mention, he was really efficient last year. Check this out, since 2011, 
Wicks had the fourth highest first down rate when targeted for rookie wide receivers. Keenan Allen and Michael Thomas are the top two. Round 12, pick 138, TJ Hawkinson. All right, it was time for a controversial pick. A tight end who tore his ACL and MCL in December. What are you doing, Pete? Here's my defense. Tight end gets really gross in these drafts. If you wait too long, you'll have to talk yourself into some truly vomit-inducing names. And spoiler alert, I'll talk about one of them in a sec. Here's my thought with Hawkinson here. He correlates with my first round pick in Justin Jefferson. I did get him at a nice value, 18 picks past his ADP. Oh. And he pairs well with my elite tight end selection. Andrews can hopefully cover for me early, and then I can maybe get some late season firepower from Hawkinson. I did do some poking around here, and the typical return timeline for his type of injury is nine months, and he had that surgery at the end of January. That would set him up for a late October return. So just doing some basic math, let's say he comes back late October, takes November to ramp up, and then we get some spike weeks in weeks 14 through 17. Yeah, I'll be more than happy with that at this price. Round 13, pick 151, running back Braylon Allen. I needed some more rookie running back upside for the zero RB room, and there are a couple interesting handcuff running backs going in this range, like Tyler Algier, Eli Mitchell, and Rico Dowdle, but then running back falls off a cliff. Trust me, I've selected Dylan Lauby way too many times. So I like grabbing Allen here before it dries up. Allen is likely to be the fourth or fifth running back off the board and go in the third round of the NFL draft. He's big, 235 pounds, and super young. He just turned 20 in January. He's not gonna catch a ton of passes, but he could be a touchdown merchant in the right fit. Round 14, pick 162, quarterback Will Levis. One interesting thing about this team is because I selected two rookie wide receivers, quarterback stacks are just harder to line up. And with Jefferson, his starting quarterback is still TBD. And for Wicks, his quarterback, Jordan Love, went off the board at 98. That meant that Levis with Nuke was one of the last available clean stacking selections for me. Levis wasn't great last year, but his skill set does line up well with Hopkins. They had that big three TD game together last year, and the team has surrounded Levis with weapons this offseason like Calvin Ridley, and they're giving him every possible chance to succeed. With Pollard, Hopkins, and Levis, I have a chance to capitalize on an undervalued offense taking a leap, similar to what we saw with the Texans in 2023 and the Jags in 2022. Round 15, pick 175, wide receiver. Zay Jones. I'll be honest, this pick didn't feel great, but with only five wide receivers on the roster, I knew I needed to keep pissing yellow. A lot of my preferred rookie wide receiver targets like Ricky Pearsall and Roman Wilson went off the board the round before, and I was left with the choice to go with Zay or throw a dart on rookies like Devontae Walker and Jermaine Burton, who could have shaky draft capital, or even a wide receiver like Wandell, excuse me, Wandale Robinson. Ultimately, I settled on Zay. He's repeatedly shown upside in this Jags offense. He no longer has to compete with Ridley for targets. And there's also a little galaxy braining divisional stacks with Zay opposite my Titans onslaught. For more on that Galbrain tip, check out the big board video on that. Round 16, pick 186, running back Keaton Mitchell. I wrapped up my running back room with another player coming off a torn ACL. Not the best theme for a team to have, but the selling point here is a running back with legitimate upside who correlates with my Ravens stack. Mitchell was electric last year down the stretch before getting hurt, and he is expected to return at some point in the 2024 season to play lightning to Derrick Henry's thunder. Similar to Hawkinson, this is a play for late in the season and giving us that playoff production. Round 17, pick 199, quarterback JJ McCarthy. I went back and forth on this pick, but ultimately went here for a few reasons. This is a spot where I wanted to lean into the differences in the biggest board format compared to the big board. Because it is easier to advance, you don't need to be as perfect with your roster. That pushes me to going three quarterbacks and three tight ends in this format to raise my floor at the onesie positions, especially when my second options, like Hawkinson, like Will Levis, are a little shaky. And now that McCarthy's draft capital is looking extremely strong, 
he appears to be a virtual lock to start the whole season, which is important because we don't want to have any dead roster spots here. The final cherry on top to this selection is playing it as if McCarthy goes to the Vikings, who are currently the favorites to draft him at minus 115. McCarthy, of course, on the Vikings would close the loop on my Jefferson and Hawkinson stacks. And I do like the idea of if Jefferson and Hawkinson hit a really high ceiling, it's because a rookie quarterback like McCarthy is better than expected. Round 18, pick 210, wide receiver Jalen McMillan. It was time to take advantage of this deep wide receiver class. And I've been absolutely McMillan pilled by JJ Zacharyson of late after reading his terrific draft guide. Here's a few nuggets. McMillan was banged up in 2023, but in 2022, he had nearly the same number of receptions per game average as Roma Dunze and outplayed Jalen Polk that year. Polk, by the way, going much higher than McMillan in these drafts. He grades out extremely well in JJ's Zap model and gets the very tantalizing stylistic comp to Amon Ross St. Brown. If he gets third round draft capital in the right room, he could be a player like Amon Ra who surges down the stretch. Don't say he could be this year's Puka. Don't say he could be this year's Puka. Don't say he could be this year's Puka. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. All right, round 19, pick 223, tight end Will Disley. All right, get your groans out. Let's have a tough combo. I was sniped on Tucker Craft. I preferred him greatly to Will Disley, but he went a few picks before this. And I do think if this were a regular big board draft, I would have just rolled with Andrews and Hawk. But I wanted to take advantage of the extra roster spots, the more loose advancement structure, and ensure that I had two tight ends contributing through the first part of the season until Hawkinson comes back. I only need to finish top four out of 12 to advance, so it would hurt to take zeros at the position when Hawk is out and if Andrews missed a game or two. No one wants to hear it, but Will Disley, is the starting tight end for the Los Angeles Chargers. They gave him a three-year, $14 million deal with $10 million guaranteed. He's basically never going to leave the field, and he should luck box his way into some tight ends. That's the best sales pitch I can do. Tell me in the comments how much you hate this pick. All right, Mr. Irrelevant, round 20, pick 234, wide receiver Khalif Raymond. One of the big selling points of both Disley and Raymond is they are not drafted in every contest and will probably be on very few rosters in the biggest board. This is a key strategy tip that we discussed in the Scroll the F Down video. Raymond is now back on the drafting menu after the team let Josh Reynolds waltz off to Denver to further complicate the Marvin Mims thesis but that is a story for another day. Raymond was good last year though. He finished 18th in the NFL in yards per route run and is a quintessential better in best ball pick who also has pretty big contingent value if the perpetually injured Jamison Williams doesn't stay healthy. I also get to galbrain some more with divisional stacking here with my Vikings and Packers bets. All right, let's do a final team review and zoom out. We finish with a three quarterback, six running back, eight wide receiver, three tight end build, which is close to my ideal structure for this smaller contest. I accomplished a lot of things that I want to do in these early drafts. Zero RB, lots of rookies, including the top wide receiver and running back prospects in this class. Big team level correlation bets with nearly half of my picks coming from just three teams, the Ravens, the Titans, and the Vikings. And then of course, some scroll the F down plays who will be on very few teams in this contest. I did find myself in some tough spots late in this draft. It wasn't perfect. It didn't always feel good. The Hawkinson pick and the Kraft snipe forced me to a late tight end pick I don't love. I also wish I could have gotten another rookie wide receiver in the 100 to 140 range, specifically Xavier Worthy, who I can't get enough of right now, but I passed over him to select Trey Benson, which I think ultimately is fine for a zero RB team. If I could have any one pick back, it would probably be the Zay pick, and instead I would just select a mystery box rookie like Devontae Walker or Jermaine Burton instead but you can't win them all. Let me know what you think of this squad. What have you done differently? Tell me the way you guys would approach a smaller contest like the biggest board compared to the big board, which by the way, if you wanna see me stream my other two biggest board drafts, $100 entries, I did a stream with the Badge Bros and I did one with Davis Maddock and Pat Corain. I'll link to both of those drafts down below. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel for more best ball strategy videos. We'll see you next week.